you hold my every moment you calm my raging seas you walk with me through fire and heal all my disease i trust
Thank you so much. That was very beautiful. Let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, in this moment, I pray that you will help us all to just lay every hindrance aside, that we could put to rest every distraction, that we could give you our undivided attention, and Lord, that you can have your way with us. So we ask this prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, today, <clears throat> I've entitled the message, The Message of the Cross. And I want to start out by saying that it is the most central thing in the message of Christianity, right? The cross. It is the symbol of Christianity. It is, it, it represents the, the hope for life that you and I have. But you know, somehow, I think that people miss, maybe you and I sometimes miss, the importance of the message of the cross. I know that the chosen people of God missed the importance of the message of the cross. When I say that, I'm talking about the Jews, right? The chosen people of God. They missed it. Now, here's what I want to say about this today. I'm, I'm going to start out be, with reading a passage from 1 Corinthians. So if you have your Bibles today, could you say amen? amen. Very good. Um, please open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm going to read a passage, and then we're going to talk about it. I'm going to begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, and we will read through verse 25. So picking up in verse 18, it says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To the Jews a stumbling block, and to the Greeks foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Now, brothers and sisters, today I want to talk to you about this message of the cross. I want to talk to you about the fact that it is power and it is wisdom. Okay? I want to compare to you what Scripture had to say regarding the Jews and the Greeks. Now, if you'll keep in mind, when Jesus was here and he was preaching, he was living in an age where Greek thought ruled the day. It was uh, Greek literature. You know, everybody wrote and spoke in Greek language. That's why the New Testament was written in Greek, right? There was a, a lot of Greek influence still prevailing in that Roman Empire. Now, yet he was addressing the Jews, who were the chosen people of God, right? So... We're comparing in this passage the Jews and the Greeks. It said that the Jews request a sign, while the Greeks, they seek after wisdom. 
So they've got two different ways that they're trying to find out what God is like, how salvation occurs. Is it through a sign that we see the power of God? Or is it through some special insight that we see the power of God? Then, with the Jews, this is a stumbling block. What is a stumbling block? The cross of Christ, the message of the crucifixion, is a stumbling block to the Jews. Because why? Because it looks like weakness. It doesn't look like power. They see a man dying on a cross. It looks like weakness, right? It looks like foolishness to the Greeks. How's that man going to save anybody? He's, he's dying. But to the Jews, Christ is the power of God. They're looking for a sign of power, and he is indeed that power. He's not just a sign of the power. He is the manifest power of God for the salvation of men. Can you say amen? To the Greeks, Christ is the wisdom of God. We had a sin problem, and God figured out a way to save humanity. And it is the, he is indeed the wisdom of God. Again, can you say amen? So you see, the weakness of God is stronger than men. It, it, if you could find any weakness, the very weakest point that you could find, which there is no weakness in God, the, the weakness of God is stronger than men. Amen? And the foolishness of God, which again, I, I have to point out, there is no real foolishness of God. But the, the point is, even if you could find the most remote thing that could approach foolishness, the foolishness of God is wiser than men. So here you have two different thought patterns being addressed. One that seeks after a sign of power and one that is seeking after a wisdom that comes from knowing. And both looking for somehow salvation through those things. While at the same time, both missing that God has given them exactly what they're looking for in Christ. The power of God and the wisdom of God in the message of the cross. Okay, having said that, I want to talk to you a little bit. I'm going to break this down. <clears throat> the Jews, it says, request a sign. And you only have to consider their history. You know, when they were coming out of Egypt, you remember the ten plagues. Those were powerful signs of God, weren't they? Powerful signs of God, that this was the people of God. The parting of the Red Sea, the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire, the manna that came down every day. I mean, these were signs of the power of God. How about the Ark of the Covenant? And when they had the Ark of the Covenant, what kinds of things happened? The fact that they would win wars and miracles that were done. All these amazing signs that the Jews were accustomed to having, right? Right? These, all these things were why they were looking for a sign. And now I want you to consider with me Matthew chapter 12. I'm going to turn there. Matthew chapter 12. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 38 and read through verse 42. <clears throat> it says in verse 38... Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see what? A sign from you. But he answered and he said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. Are you seeing actually what he's saying right there? It, the Ninevites, they responded to when God intervened through Jonah. 
and it's saying that they're going to raise up and condemn this generation that Jesus is speaking to because a greater than Jonah is addressing them and they're not receiving him. Do you get that? Okay, then in verse 42, the queen of the south will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, greater than Solomon is here. You've heard about how wise Solomon was and how this queen came from lakes with great treasures to, not only did she travel the world to go see Solomon, but she brought him great treasures. Why? So she could hear the man speak because she recognized that there was great treasure in what he had to say. And he's saying, She's going to be raised up and condemn this generation because one greater than Solomon is addressing you right now and you're missing it. Right? This is what Jesus is saying to them, that they are absolutely missing it because they're seeking after a sign. Okay. Now moving on. Just right here, you know, one of the, one of the plagues these great signs that God showed was when he turned the water into blood, right? Can you imagine? I mean, that, that was such a tremendous show of the power of God. And the Jews, you'll remember, they were challenging Jesus all the time, the Jewish leaders of the day. They were challenging Jesus, and they wanted to see if Jesus could prove that he really was indeed God. Even down to the point, brothers and sisters, where he was hanging on the cross. When he was hanging on the cross, they, they said to him, if you really are the son of God, then come down there from there. Still looking for a sign. Even up to that very moment. Now, oh, before I go here, I want to say this. I, I want you to recognize, first of all, I'm not just trying to uh, speak against the Jewish leadership and stuff like that because I have no, no qualm with the Jews. I'm addressing the Jews because the scriptural passage addressed the Jews. So what I'm really addressing is the mindset. The mindset was that which seeked after, after a sign. Okay? So please understand that. Next, we're going to deal with the other group that he addressed in there. The Greeks, they sought after, a w after wisdom. And in Greek, I don't know if you can see that top, uh, there's a Greek word written there, and it's called logos. Logos is a very key term in Greek. And what it is, it actually means word, or it means a, uh, a thought, a very thoughtful word, then it has, there's power behind these words. In fact, this is a society that was built on philosophy, psychology, rhetoric, and religion. This is where you had the birth of the different philosophers. And, you know, Aristotle called this logos reasoned discourse. And within his idea of reasoned discourse, one could find happiness because they had brought and, and cultivated within themselves virtue. And so it was a kind of a, a self-actualization type thing where you're becoming something through your own efforts. Also in this Greek period was Hellenistic philosophy. Pleasure was considered the supreme good, especially immediate gratification. If it feels good, that's the right thing. That's exactly what we're supposed to be doing. That was a, a mindset during this Greek period. Stoicism was born out of this, where moral and intellectual perfection was supposed to overcome destructive emotions. You're not supposed to feel anything negative or bad. That's why sometimes they would say that guy has a stoic calm in the face of tragedy. tragedy. You know. Mythology was very popular with this group. It wasn't just uh, uh, stories like we hear it today. What comes to mind when I say mythology? What comes to mind? Just throw something out. Greek gods, right. Greek what? Gods, right? So they had this whole system of teaching 
about the origin of man, the problems and tribulations of man, how God would overcome and stuff like that. And they had this whole system of false teachings that were based on false gods. Okay? And the bottom line here is the key mindset of the Greeks was that there is a wisdom, a higher plane, a higher way of of doing things, of thinking. And this was the great arrival. Like the Jews, what was their mindset again? What did they want? They wanted to see a sign. We need to see some miracle. Now, and the Greeks, they think there's got to be some great idea. There's got to be some great knowledge, some great words. And so these two thought processes were what Paul was addressing when he was saying that the message of the cross flies in the face of those and it actually addresses the real needs behind them. Okay, so I want you to consider 2 Timothy chapter 4. Let's go there with me. Um, 2 Timothy, if you're there, say amen. All right, very good. 2 Timothy chapter 4, and we're going to read verses 3 and 4. Look at what it says in verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from hearing the truth and be turned aside to fables. And friends, that's exactly what was happening. The, the Bible describes exactly what the, the Jewish leaders of the day were doing, and it describes exactly what the Greek leaders of the day were doing. Okay? They were heaping up for themselves teachers that would say interesting things. Like one of them I even put up there, Hellenistic philosophy. Pleasure is the supreme good. If it feels good immediately for you to do it, that is exactly what you should be doing in your life. That was the key concept. How many of you think that is a safe principle? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, moving along here, what we're looking at here is in Greek mythology, a god that was considered to be very prominent, very important in the development of all, all the Grecian uh, philosophy is Zeus. But you might be saying, okay, how does this, how can you take what you're talking about with the Jews and the Greeks and, and how it was addressing their mindsets, how can that apply to me? What you're addressing, how does that make any sense in my life? Well, I want to ask you to consider, do you request a sign from God? Are you a person who is looking for God to show you some kind of a sign so that you then can act according to the way that he's told you in his word that you should act? Okay, in other words... Let's look at James chapter 4, verse 3. I want to go here first. James chapter 4, if you're there, say amen. Verse 3, I want to first consider prayer, okay? Sometimes people are, they're, they're trying to figure out what it is that's supposed to happen in their lives, and so they're asking for God to show them some kind of a miracle through prayer, Okay? But a huge problem for us human beings is that sometimes, according to James chapter 4 and verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask how? Amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. In other words, you don't ask disinterestedly, you ask with an interest in your self-gratification in yourself, whatever it is, your selfish focus. Instead of asking God, what is it do you want for my life so that I can yield my life to you? Instead, you say, God, will you do this for me? That's what I'm looking for, some miracle. Will you open this door? And you're asking according to your own desires. That's one way that we can request a sign from God and be caught in that that mindset. I want you to consider what it says in Revelation chapter 16, and I'm not going to go into this teaching, but I, I do want you to consider what it says here in Revelation chapter 16. 
Revelation chapter 16, beginning in verse 13 and reading through verse 14. If you're there, say amen. Okay, verse 13 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing what? Miracles or signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. What I want to get across right here is simple. Satan is also in the business of working miracles. That's, all I, that's my whole point right here. I'm not trying to go into this lesson in Revelation 16, which I will at some point, but that's not today. My point with pointing this out is that Satan is able to perform signs and wonders and be involved in miracles. You cannot trust, you cannot have a mindset that is based just on signs and wonders. This is a problem. And some people, let me make it really simple and, and practical for you. Some people use this kind of phrasing. If God really wants blank, then he will blank. Now, I, I could put it this way. Let's say, if God really wants me to keep the Sabbath, then he'll provide me a job in which I don't have to work on the Sabbath so I can quit this one. Mm. What do you think about that reasoning? Do you think that God ever calls you into obedience and you are stepping out into the realm of the unknown and you don't know how he's going to provide for you, but all of a sudden he shores up your steps and all of a sudden there's the provision. You didn't know where it was coming from, but you were obedient and God provided. Or how about, uh, if God really wants me to pay a faithful tithe, then he'll provide me a raise in my paycheck because I'm barely making enough to get by right now. But I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, God is calling us to be faithful to what he has commanded. He is calling us to recognize what he has already dictated in his word, and this is the means by which I'm doing something. And then for us to call for a sign is faulty thinking. We are to obey and believe and trust in what he has called us to do and step out in faith and then expect that God will show up because where he guides, he's also going to provide. Does this make sense? If you wait for a sign, you'll probably get one. But it might be from the enemy. Because it is clear that the enemy is also in the business of working miracles and signs and wonders. What am I really saying? Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. If he commanded it, yield, obey, follow it. If he promised it, believe it. Step out in faith. Go forward with a reckless abandon because you know who you trust. Do you understand? Now, let's consider the next thing. Do we seek after wisdom outside of God? You see how I'm, uh, what I'm doing is I'm taking first of all the Jewish mindset of looking for a sign. Now I'm taking the Greek mindset. Are we looking for wisdom? Okay, outside of God. And first of all, let's take a look at Proverbs. By the way, who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon, what do we know about him? Wisest man ever, right? Seeking after wisdom, it makes sense to consider some of what he has to say here, right? So, Proverbs chapter 14, and I'm going to read verse 12. If you're there, say amen. All right. Verse 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of what? Death. 
In other words, you and I can come up with some pretty intricate schemes. We can come up with these plans. We can devise all these ways how we're going to address our lives and somehow make things better. But I want you to understand, brothers and sisters, that every time that you turn a deaf ear to the clear word of God and you start designing things according to your own way, it is the way of death. It seems right. It might make sense on paper. It might make sense as you consider relationships that you have. But you're going outside of God's will, and you know that. And I'm going to tell you something. There is no safety when you are stepping outside of God's clear instructions. That is not where the safety is. The safety is within what God commands in his word. It is within the counsels of his word. He has given us commands to follow. He has given us principles to apply in our lives. He's given us promises on which we can stand and believe and gain victories. And when we go outside of his counsels, that is not wise. Isaiah chapter 55 Turn there with me, if you will. Isaiah chapter 55. I'm going to read verses 8 and 9. If you're there, say amen. I want you to hear plainly what God is saying here. He says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways, are your ways my ways, says the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, here's the thing. You and I, we have ideas about what things, how things should be, don't we? Don't we? And sometimes, how you think things should go, and how God thinks things should go, are worlds apart. His ways are so much higher. His wisdom is, I mean, we can't even begin to hold a candle to it. His foolishness is wiser than our wisdom. Right? So the, we start to <laughs> lay these plans for our lives. Oh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this and that. We're going to build our lives this way. This, this is exactly how it's going to look. And we start laying these plans for our lives. And then, you know what happens usually? Is then people will say, okay, God, here's the plan. Please bless it, Lord. Help it to be successful now that I've got the plan and informed you of how my life is going to go. Please bless it. And God is looking for us to take a surrendered submitted attitude to him and basically say, God, I don't know nothing. If I'm as smart as Solomon, I'll say, I don't even know how to go in or come out. I don't know anything. I need you to teach me. I need you to show me what's right. I need to know what's the next step that you want me to take in my life. What's an important building block, Lord? Help me to learn from your word. Give me the courage to apply what your word says and adapt my life to it, no matter what else seems to be happening in my circumstances. That's wise. Hello? Do you think so? You know, <clears throat> today, people cite all these experts, man. There's gurus in every field. There's leadership gurus. There's financial gurus. There's, there's health and fitness gurus. There's relationship gurus. You, you go on, right? There's experts in every field. And people, when they're considering their lives and they're considering how it is that they're building their relationships, how it is that they're managing their finances, how it is that they are, um, you know, addressing their health, 
All these things, they're considering what they might see on TV, on cable or something, what they read off the internet, some amazing report, what Dr. Oz said. But I'm gonna tell you something. We need to consider what the word of God says. Because what I want you to know is the message of the cross is power and it's wisdom. And there is no other way for you to be saved and for you to have a good life outside of God. You can't do it. I can't do it either. We can't do it. Scripture says that the just live by faith. In fact, let's look at it in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. If you're there, say amen. All right, Romans chapter 1. We're going to read verses 16 and 17. Verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. So it addresses again both of those groups and both of those mindsets, and it's saying the gospel of Christ, Christ dying on the cross for my sins, this is the power of salvation. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. No matter what mindset you're coming from, this is what we need to come to understand. In verse 17 it says, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now I'm going to tell you something. With either the mindset of show me a sign, God, so I can assess and see that there's power, or the mindset of I want to consider all these other sources of wisdom so I can assess and see what I think is right. Either way, it is putting you in the driver's seat of deciding what is right for my life and not allowing God the chance to do so. It's making you Lord of yourself. Do you understand that? Hello, do you understand that? Seriously, this is important. Uh, what we need to understand, in verse 17, it says, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. Listen, the way that you come to have a saving relationship with Jesus, the way that you recognize that he provides for your salvation is through faith. You have to believe that it comes from outside of you. There's nothing you can do to create it. There's nothing you can do to strengthen it. You can't manufacture it. There's, it's something God does. And you have to believe by faith that that is something that God has done to intervene in your life crisis because you're going to die without him. Right? And secondly... It says from faith to faith, from the moment you believe it until the moment that you are translated into his kingdom, it will require a faith walk with God. You have to keep believing and stepping out in faith, following and obeying, trusting and obeying day by day. Not that you're somehow getting better where finally you're good enough that you can assess whether the power is good enough or, or you've got enough knowledge. No, you keep putting your faith in the provision of God. And every day, he works a miracle in your heart and in your mind to help you to walk along the path of righteousness for his name's sake. And he will lead you safely into his kingdom, but it is from faith to faith, brothers and sisters. The just shall live by faith. So, the Lamb of God, I mean, when you consider, you know, man, show me some power, or show me some wisdom, and then they show, get shown a lamb, right? And it's like, who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? 
it just doesn't seem like a sign of power. It just doesn't seem like a, a wise intervention. A little lamb. But the lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world is exactly that. It is both power and wisdom. And look again back at 1 Corinthians where we started. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. Are you there? Amen. Amen. It says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. It is the power of God. When, when somebody who is looking at things from a secular standpoint looks at that picture, they would see and think, there's somebody who's defeated. But to those of us who have received his message, and we believe it, and we've adapted our entire lives to revolve around the hope that is in this message. This is exactly a picture of power. It is a picture of the wisdom of God to solve our sin problem. The message of the cross is powerful. The message of the cross is wisdom. I'm going to take it one step further with you. You know that Christ calls us to follow him, doesn't he? And you'll notice here in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25, he says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him do what? Deny himself. And then what? Take up his cross and follow me. Now I want to pause right there to say this. Denying yourself is exactly the opposite of assessing the situation and seeing if you think that's a demonstration of power or not. It's exactly the opposite of appealing to my logic and reason to figure if I think this is a good idea or not. Denying myself is putting aside my perception of power or wisdom and considering what God has to say and yielding my life to that. So, deny yourself and take up your cross. I want to ask you, I've asked you before, but it's been a little while. I want to see if you remember. If anybody takes up their cross, where are they headed? Where are they going? They're going to die, right? Anybody who takes up their cross is on their way to death. Death to yourself means life in Christ. Read on. What does it say? For whoever desires to save his life will do what? Lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. You're looking for a way to have a blessing in your life. You're looking for a way to have wonderful things happen in your life. I'm just simply saying, don't appeal to your own reason. Instead, consider the message of the cross. Consider the message of the cross. The way that God intervened on your behalf and on mine was to save us, to heal our sin problem, to intervene when nothing else could be done. And the way that he continues to lead you from faith to faith is he invites you to follow him. Do the same thing. Die to yourself. Let, him, let your life be about him. Submit to him. Yield to him and follow him. And you will find life and you will find it more abundantly. Friends, these are interesting days we live in, right? Every day, every single day, you make choices. Every day, you're considering, are you going to pick up the cross? Are you going to follow Christ? And it cannot just be in word lip service. That means I'm not going to do things my own way anymore. 
I'm honestly going to yield to what God says in his word. I'm going to trust him with the, with the outcome. And I'm just going to step out in faith and obedience. And I'm going to do what God says because he is trustworthy. Friends, I promise you, I promise you that if you will try that wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly, your life will be blessed. You will have a, a remarkable transformation in your life. If you don't believe me, I challenge you to try it. Amen. Put aside your own ways. Yes. Seek God with your whole heart. Trust him. Give him the chance to show you that he really does have the power and the wisdom that you're looking for. He'll bless you. Amen? Amen. Let me tell you something. There's power in the blood of Christ. And on that note, I'd like us to sing our closing Two hundred and ninety four, there's power in the blood. Let's all stand. Two ninety four. I have a closing prayer with you. I, I want to say to you that I believe God is trying to help us to come to a place where we're not trying to figure out our own salvation, where we're, in other words, <laughs> we're trusting him for what he's done, for what he's provided, and then we're yielding to him for what he has called us to. I, I want you to know that I understand that life can be confusing. It can be complicated, it can be hard. And I know that sin can be appealing. But I also know that those who go their own way, while they may think they have the world by the tail for a short time, and while there may be pleasure in sin for a season, they will be so sorely disappointed when they recognize that everything is just as God says in his word. And that the only way of having life, fulfillment, freedom, healing, blessing is through Christ. The message of the cross 
It is the power of salvation to us who believe. So let us believe the word of God, the sure word of God. Amen? Amen. Let me pray with you. Father, I thank you for your holy word. And I thank you for your intervention and uh, and our sin problem. Lord, truly, without you, we are lost. But through you, we have hope and help and blessing and life and liberty. And we thank you so much for what it is that you're offering to us. I pray that you will help us to stop leaning to our own understanding and instead to trust you with all our hearts. Lord, I I know that as we acknowledge you, that you will direct our paths. And I ask that you will do exactly that for all of us. We need you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.